Okay, well, um, thank you everybody for coming. So my, uh, my talk is not about inverse problems, but uh, I checked with Katya in advance and she says that the seminar is expanding beyond inverse problems and these are spectral asymptotics problems that I'm going to be discussing. So that I hope it fits in with people's interests. Um, I'm not going to be talking too much about proofs as a result. I want to really try to explain what problems uh, I'm working on and why they're interesting. And so uh, the work I'm talking about is partly uh, joint work with Emmett Wyman and Yakun Chi. <coughs> so probably everybody has heard about restriction problems in Fourier analysis. It's, one of the most famous things being studied in contemporary Fourier analysis, sort of originated by Stein maybe 20, 30 years ago, 30 or 40 years ago. And there are two different types of restriction problems in Fourier analysis. So first of all, by Fourier analysis, I'm going to just mean the spectral theory of a Laplace operator on a Riemannian manifold. So the one that Stein was interested in is called the Fourier restriction problem. And you can state this in, in a, two dual ways. But the way I think of it is that you define a, an eigenfunction of the Laplacian, this is on Rn, uh, by an integral over a sphere in the Fourier or frequency space, norm C equals R, and you have uh, the usual exponential e to the Ixc against some kind of distribution on the sphere. <laughs> and you would like to relate the properties of the distribution t to the eigenfunction phi. You could uh, integrate over more general hypersurfaces or regions or curves or anything. But these are sort of Fourier restriction problems because the Fourier transform or the Fourier integral is restricted to some submanifold or subset of Rn. Um, Sog, in his thesis back in 1985, uh, studied or introduced the discrete version of the restriction problem. And it's very closely related to this talk. So the discrete version of the restriction problem is to work on a compact Riemannian manifold and uh, replace this integral by just a sum of over eigenfunctions with eigenvalues in a small interval. So we'll see what that means. But that's called the discrete restriction problem because instead of having these continuous spectrum e to the ixc, you have just discrete eigenfunctions. Um, now the second type of restriction problem uh, is, is a spatial restriction problem where you have eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, but you restrict them to submanifolds. And you are interested in you know, how large are the restrictions? Um, so uh, you're inter interested in integrals of the eigenfunctions over submanifolds. So there are many, many types of problems like this. So by comparison with the Stein problem, this kind of spatial restriction problem uh, is classical and goes back to the late 19th century. And there are many, many classical works on it. So when this talk or the projects I'm going to discuss are kind of a mixture of the two restriction problems. On the one hand, well, we'll only be dealing with a compact Riemannian manifold, although there's no particular reason why you can't study the problem. I mean, you could study the problem for infinite volume or non-compact Riemannian manifolds. But um, so we're going to have a manifold, a Riemannian manifold M with metric G and we have a submanifold H and we restrict the metric to H. So it's, um, it's a sub-Riemannian manifold of MG. And we are gonna be considering two different Laplacians, the Laplacian for MG and the Laplacian for H. And so uh, we let phi J throughout the talk is going to denote an orthonormal basis of eigenfunctions on the global manifold I denote the eigenvalues by uh, lambda j squared. So lambda j for me is a frequency. 
And then uh, for the for H, we denote the orthonormal basis of eigenfunctions by E sub K. And the notation is intended to remind you of E to the I K X or something so that you can keep track of which ones, which eigenfunctions are on which manifolds. So we're going to restrict the global eigenfunction phi j to h, and then we are going to expand it in terms of uh, eigenfunctions on h. So I call that a Fourier expansion. And uh, the most traditional case, the one that was studied quite a lot in the 19th century is when h is a closed geodesic or a closed curve on a, on a surface. And then the eigenfunctions with respect to the, you know, there's only one metric on a circle. So, you know, the eigenfunctions just look like e to the i k uh, times uh, s times, you know, two pi over l or something, and where s is arc length. So uh, it's very common. The way that, well, let me give you an example of that. So <laughs> this is the most classical example. People in automorphic forms and number theory have been interested in the Fourier coefficients of eigenfunctions. They work both with holomorphic things and with C infinity, C infinity forms. The most widely studied are called Heckamas forms. We're not going to go into that, but this is this is the most famous Fourier expansion. We have uh, the upper half plane modulo SL2Z. It has a, a cusp. Usually we write it going from bottom to top, but it didn't fit on the page. So we write it from left to right. And uh, the Y coordinate is the horizontal coordinate. So we have a lot of these closed horocycles and you restrict uh, an eigenfunction on the surface. This is assumed to be what's called a cusp form, uh, a cuspidal eigenfunction, which means it's zero for a coefficient vanishes. So you restrict it uh, to the different horocycles. You have many of them depending on Y and you restrict it, and then you expand it into a Fourier series along the horror cycle. So, you know, the way that it's described in any book on automorphic forms is that an eigenfunction is a completely unknowable object, but uh, the best handle you have on it is to write down its Fourier expansion along some kind of a nice curve, like a geodesic or a horror cycle and try to understand the Fourier coefficients. And uh, HECA theory is the whole theory of, of what these Fourier coefficients behave like. For HECA mass forms, it's a very elaborate, very highly developed theory. I won't say anything about it because it's not a PDE theory. It's, it, it's a number theory. Now, because we have um, curves depending on a parameter y, uh, you can separate variables in this problem. And uh, you can, for us, the Fourier coefficient is actually this whole thing. To a number theorist, you only are interested in this coefficient. This is a K-Bessel function. And in classical analysis, people have many, many studies of its behavior. So it's sort of, under, sort of known. So what's unknown are these ANs. For a general surface, you aren't going to be able to separate variables and be able to split off these two pieces of data here. So for us, the Fourier coefficient is always going to be the blued in thing, not the ANs themselves. Okay, and I might point out that almost all the results in the classical literature to date on the Fourier coefficients, not using Hecke theory, are really just based on a study of this function and they will all be subsumed under the kind of general results that I'm going to discuss. So I don't need to convince people here that wave equation methods and differential operative theory is a far more powerful thing than just trying to plug in weird test functions into formulas and try to work things out. All right, now we're going to be restricting eigenfunctions to, to uh, closed curves and uh, just to have a picture, uh, if, you, if you do the restriction problem on a sphere, uh, there are some very simple examples you can experiment with to see what is going on. So if I use the standard basis y, y, m, y sub n super m, uh, 
So N is the degree of the spherical harmonic and M is it's, uh, you know, the, the character, it's like E to the I N theta as I wrote down over here. You can separate variables and you can study the restriction of this, for example, to the equator, or you could study its restriction to a latitude circle. And you can see already that you're going to run into problems because if it's restricted to a, the equator, it's all kind of very simple because this is, a, this is just one or something. And uh, it really just depends on what these uh, normalizing coefficients are. We always use L2 normalized eigenfunctions. But if you restrict this to a latitude circle, then you're gonna to have to understand special values of Legendre polynomials, which is not well understood actually. And uh, this is the simplest possible things you could do. I could have taken this function and restricted it to this, this vertical geodesic instead. And then I get completely different answers. You notice that this function has exactly one Fourier coefficient if you restrict it to one of these rotational curves. If you restrict it to a vertical geodesic, it has Fourier coefficients of all degrees. So there are a lot of different types of phenomena which can occur here. So the first thing to understand about these Fourier coefficient problems is that the, the Fourier coefficients are essentially trivial if the H eigenvalue UK, mu k is uh, bigger than the m eigenvalue lambda k. So that's this lemma over here. These Fourier coefficients are, are negligible. And uh, for people here, everybody is probably aware of like allowed and forbidden regions for Schrodinger operators. <coughs> and so when mu k is bigger than lambda j, you're sort of in a you're sort of in a, uh, a forbidden region, and everything is going to be exponentially decaying. You won't have any critical points in the various Fourier integrals. So we're going to just concentrate on the uh, h frequencies lying from zero to lambda j. This epsilon is arbitrary, and if you wanted to, if you work harder, you can sort of uh, you know get just a very very thin neighborhood in terms of lambda away from the right endpoint, lambda j. But I'm just trying to emphasize that throughout this talk, we're only going to be considering the uh, frequencies along h, which lie in this spectral interval. They'll depend on the eigenvalue of this eigenfunction here. So you can write down our problem in terms like uh, in, in sort of SOG sense. SOG was, was studying Fourier restriction on the discrete, discrete level. Well, we're looking at the Fourier restriction problem for the spatial restriction of phi j. So we restrict phi j to h, and then we look at the orthogonal projection for the h eigenvalues onto an interval i. And this is like Fourier restriction of the spatial restriction, if you like. And it, it mixes together both theories. So the intervals i that we're going to be studying here will be uh, just only of this form. So this number c will be between zero and one. And so mu, the possible mu k's, they uh, lie between zero and lambda j. So if c is less than one, we're sort of centering it at, at like a half lambda j instead of lambda j, or maybe a quarter lambda j or maybe right up to the edge and study lambda j itself. So this C parameter is actually very important. This has been like noticed in many, many papers on Fourier coefficients of automorphic forms that somehow all the action is when C is equal to one. All right, so the Fourier restriction is, uh, this, is uh, this is sort of the Fourier restriction of the spatial restriction. <laughs> we restrict the eigenfunction phi j to h and then we orthogonally project it onto a band of, eigenval of eigenfunctions on H. Let me pause here for a moment and see if there were questions about the notation or anything. No? All right. So the main problems are the following. Some of these problems are 
you know, within sort of the standard purview of microlocal analysis and spectral asymptotics, some of them are, are not. And of course, you know, we're, it's a, it's a long project. So I'm going to be discussing more like initial results. And then I try to explain where we're heading with it. So the first thing we're interested in are um, what I call Kuznetsov vial asymptotics. The vile part is that we're summing over the eigenvalues of M, that we're summing over eigenvalues less or equal to lambda. <laughs> and then we sum over a band of frequencies on H of this form that I mentioned that the, the, uh, the H eigenvalue minus C times the lambda J eigenvalue is less than epsilon. So this is a very short interval. I'll, I'll explain in a moment around lambda J, around C actually. So the, I call this Kuznetsov vial asymptotic. So people in this audience may not know who Kuznetsov is, but he is uh, very famous in automorphic forms from a paper in 1981. You probably know that Selberg introduced a trace formula, which was the integrals over the diagonal of various operators. And that was like, uh, it still remains one of the principal tools. Kuznetsov said, why don't we integrate over the diagonal? Why don't we just take these kernels of Selberg and integrate them over a pair of submanifolds. Of course, for him, they were like horse cycles. So we can we could just integrate some kernel over a pair of horse cycles. And if you do, you get these kinds of expressions. So Kuznetsov worked them out explicitly uh, in the case in the case of uh, horse cycles. And uh, I won't say more about it than that. But back in in the late eighties. Uh, you know, I was reading Deutschmark Gilliman. This was 1975. I was a graduate student uh, just a little after that. So Deutschmark Gilliman, and uh, he he generalized Selberg trace formula to any Riemannian manifold. So I said, well, well let's do the same thing for Kuznetsov and then generalize it to any Riemannian manifold. And uh, it's become a kind of popular topic over the last like 10 years. You know, uh, I proved kind of universal results, but you can easily beat what I proved for the remainder estimates. And there have been like, I don't know, 50 to 100 articles beating them. So that was all C equals zero. So at some point we wonder, why don't we like try to understand the general case? So the one thing is to get the principal term in the asymptotics. For people in spectral asymptotics, you know, it's really interesting to understand the jumps. You know, these are sort of Steve? the contributions of the question. Steve, shouldn't yeah. that be N of lambda rather than lambda J? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. And so you get you get you get jumps. So the vile part is this part, the Kuznetsov is this part, but you get jumps at the eigenvalues. And the so I'm cheating a little bit here, but the jumps at the eigenvalues would just be, you know, the sum of squares of the Fourier coefficients when the uh, mu k's lie in this interval around, around the C lambda j. So I, I think of this as like how much mass of the restriction or energy of the restriction lies in this band of Fourier coefficients. Many people have studied the L2 norms of restrictions Bertrand Svetkov, I think, had the first paper, maybe uh, in general Riemannian setting. But you know, we're sort of breaking up the L2 norms of restrictions into Fourier bands and trying to figure out which Fourier bands dominate the L2 norm of the restriction. So that's that's what these jumps are like. Here, um, literally, you should sum over repeated eigenvalues if if lambda j has multiplicity. I'm suppressing that for the time being. I'll come back to it later. So you might say that this is like the goal is to get really, really good understanding of the Fourier coefficients of an individual eigenfunction. It's more or less hopeless in general to understand one Fourier coefficient of one eigenfunction, even in automorphic forms theory where they have so many more tools. It's more or less hopeless. So everybody studies you know, the behavior in a band of, of uh, eigenvalues on H. Uh, even that is basically impossible, except in special cases. And so you really have to average it in addition over the eigenfunction on it. 
you know, we don't really want to do that. We really want to understand these things, the Fourier coefficients of individual eigenfunctions. We do this because it's what we can do. And then we try to draw conclusions about the jumps using the standard or not so standard techniques in, in semi-classical analysis. Now, to me, the motivating problem is um, beyond really the purview of standard microlocal analysis to my knowledge. And so there's only a, we haven't gotten very far with it but it's sort of where we're, what we're trying to understand. Namely, it's what I call equipartition of Fourier mass. How does this jump formula depend on C? In other words, are these, are these individual Fourier coefficients kind of uniformly spread out over the possible um, U case, or do the Fourier coefficients concentrate someplace? And uh, there are actually many numerical experiments on this going back for about 30 years, especially in quantum chaos literature. So it really, really depends on the dynamics of the geodesic flows of M and NH. So before I get into that, everywhere here we have a C parameter. So let's think about what that C parameter is about. On the one hand, it has a geometric interpretation. So what the C parameter means is that for the Kuznetsov sums with a C in it, you know, there's going to be some underlying dynamical geodesic flow properties coming in. And, um, but they only are, when you fix C, the only geodesics that are interesting have initial data C where, uh, where the projection of C to H, so C is a covector along H, other covectors don't count. And if you take the projection of, of C to H and look at its norm and divide by the norm of C, of C, that is what little C measures. So it sort of measures the, the sort of cones uh, of covectors with foot point on H and what's the like aperture of the cone. So C equals zero, well, C equals zero means that the covectors are orthogonal to H. C equals one means it's tangent to H. So we're interested in how this band of Fourier coefficients is going to vary. And it turns out it has radically different behavior for C less than one and for C equals to one. And that, that's really not surprising. You always get these edge effects where you know, the edge of the spectral interval from mu case is uh, where C equals one. And the edge, eigen, the edge frequencies on H, the ones right at the end, edge of the interval, zero to lambda J, they are uh, completely different type of asymptotics from the bulk in the middle. And they're also all the extremals will happen at the edge. So let's like look at it quantum mechanically. What does the C parameter mean quantum mechanically? Well, here's the way I wrote it down, uh, but maybe it's more illuminating to divide by lambda J and write it this way. As we all know, lambda J inverse is a Planck constant in these problems. So we can think of it as an H bar. And uh, we always kind of tend to normalize the Laplacian by H bar squared Laplacian. Here I took a square root. So this is like the semi, these are the eigenvalues of H bar times square root of Laplacian on H. And we are, we're looking at intervals around C, which are really thin. If I divide like this, these are H bar intervals around the different Cs. So we're really focusing in on very short intervals. I, I probably, I'm not actually rooting it into the slides, but what we're going to have to use is a Fourier integral operator theory, which was introduced by uh, Gilliman, Sternberg, and Uribe, which is called ladder theory. And it's exactly the theory of sort of how, how in a joint spectrum you can like focus on, on these kind of uh, eigenvalues very close to these eigenvalues. So uh, technically speaking, we're using this, uh, we're using this, um, sort of ladder theory. 
Uh, anyway, so here, the most studied cases I mentioned before is when C equals zero. And then you're just looking at integrals of eigenfunctions over, over submanifolds. It won't make any difference if you integrate with respect to arc length or you put in some other function here, you get a result either way. And uh, these correspond to the geodesics. The, the sort of governing dynamics is the geodesics are orthogonal to H. So that's a very, very well studied problem. Now, uh, we're very interested, not just in the leading order term, but in the remainder terms, and particularly in understanding uh, what are the extremals for these problems? Meaning like when do remainders and jumps achieve the maximum possible size? So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of obvious that the extremals will occur on a standard sphere. If you pick a standard subsphere of a standard sphere, you know, in every problem in spectralized mitotics, you get the extremals. It's more interesting to figure out if there are other types of examples besides spheres. But we can, turns out that for these problems, even getting the precise nature of what happens when you restrict the subspheres of spheres is, is not an easy problem. However, if we look at these standard Y and M's again, the standard basis, which have uh, degree n and uh, angular momentum m, and we restrict to the equator geodesic, then uh, each one of these restrictions has just one non-zero Fourier mode. It's obvious, and that is a uh, you know that shows you that we have the opposite of equi partition of Fourier energy. It's just one mode where it's concentrated, and how large that Fourier coefficient is depends on this ratio m divided by n. I'm not going to go through all the cases, just some extremes. If h is the equator, and we pick, we'll, we'll talk about this extensively, and, we'll, and we pick m to be plus or minus n, then we get an extremal. It's going to be the restriction of a Gaussian beam to the equator, and we get an extremal mass. Um, on the other hand, if I took that same Gaussian beam, and I changed H to be a latitude circle away from the equator, it's exponentially small there. And you get completely different extremals if you take a latitude circle, which I bet many people can guess that you're gonna get the eigenfunctions where they correspond to tori with fold singularities along the latitude circles. That gives you a little bit of an inkling that there are a lot of different types of possible phenomena here. Uh, on the other hand, you know, perhaps the most interesting example in this, in this field is when you take a hyperbolic surface and you pick H to be a nice curve, closed geodesic, a distant circle, some sort of nice thing like that. They've all been studied e extensively. And uh, then what do you expect about the equipartition partition of Fourier coefficients? The expectation, which is not always true, is that the Fourier coefficients are basically, um, it's sort of uniform mass as you, as you change the Fourier coefficient. They're all roughly the same size with a slight enhancement at the edge. All right, so of course that would be an extremely ambitious problem to try to prove that, but that is what is motivating the work in this field. All right, so in microlocal analysis, we like these extremals. In applications to other fields such as automorphic forms, um, you're not going to get extremal behavior. So what you're really interested in is really sharp estimates on these Fourier coefficients. And you hope to improve the kind of generic remainder estimates of this talk, usually by logarithms. If you're really, really, if you're really lucky, maybe a power. All right, so now I'm going to state uh, some results. So uh, I'm going to, you know, in spectral asymptotics, when we want to understand behavior on sharp intervals, we usually smooth out indicator functions and study them first and then try to remove the smoothing. 
Now here we actually have two different types of eigenvalues. We'd have the eigenvalues on H and the eigenvalues on M. And so we have two different indicator functions. If you go back to, to this, we have this interval here uh, on H, and then we have this interval here for M. That's two indicators. So in this problem, this is not such a simple problem. We have still a sharp interval in the lambdas, but we, we sort of smooth out the indicator in the, in the uh, mu case. Now, to get a good result, an initial result, we need to assume that the, for a transform of size compactly supported and for reasons that we'll be seeing. But I think many people will understand it, that otherwise you have to study the geodesic flow for all time. So we want to constrain the Fourier transform, but that means we're not gonna be able to approximate an indicator function very well. So, okay, so that's what we're gonna have, to, there's quite a lot of steps involved. But um, let's first try to understand the geodesic geometry that underlies the asymptotics of this sum. So we call that CST biangle geometry. So I think everybody in the audience is familiar with the triangle. Perhaps not everybody in the audience is familiar with the biangle. So I'll give you some pictures of it. A biangle, it's sort of like a triangle with two sides. A biangle consists of two geodesic arcs. One is going to lie on M. It's going to be a geodesic of M. The second arc is a geodesic of H. Okay. But there's a consistency condition between the length of the arc on M and the length of the arc on H. So the one on H has length S. The C comes into the one, the length of the geodesic on M. And uh, moreover, moreover, the angle with which the geodesic on M makes with H has to be the same at the beginning, at the initial point and the terminal point. So the, that's why we have a called a C ST by angle. So, um, I, I make a notation here for the, the uh, covectors along H, which make a certain angle to H. There are covectors to M, which have foot point on H. So I write them as TCHM. And so it, it just means, it's just a definition of C. It's the covectors which satisfy the definition of C. If you look at the ratio of the length of the projected covector to the original one, you get C. If I look at unit covectors so that the right hand side is one, this norm C is one, I, I just call them SCH of M. Now, uh, the, the, if you want to write out the, the actual equations for, a, for these biangles, you, you, get this, you get this kind of equation. And we're sort of looking at the fixed points of this equation. So, you take a covector to H, a law to H, um, which has this angle C, and we propagate it for a certain time on M, and then uh, it hits H again. It's got to hit H, and then we project it back onto H, and we go backwards by the geodesic flow on H. So this is sort of like saying, and then we're supposed to get the projected vector at the initial point. So it's sort of like saying that the biangle is a closed geodesic. You go out along the geodesic on M and backwards along the, along the geodesic on H where you project the terminal velocity to H and it's got to close up. So in particular, it's important to understand what happens for various values of these parameters. If T is equal to zero, if T is equal to zero, then uh, we get this equation down here. And these, these are gonna be the important ones for the main term. These are the important uh, covectors for the main term. Well, you notice that you, if you fix both S and T equal to zero, you, don't, you get a trivial equation. 
So when S and T are zero, everything is a CST biangle for every C. That's when S and T are both zero. And that's typical in spectral asymptotics that when you have T equals zero, you get the fixed point set of the geodesic flow at time T, it's everything. And that produces the main term in the via law. So that's, that's reasonable. But trying to understand the geometry of these when S and T are very large, it's, it's rather complicated. Let me uh, just draw a picture. Here, here's a sphere. And on the sphere, I have two different geodesics here. I have the one going through P and Q and this one going through U and V. So a biangle might be, these are geodesics and the one, the H doesn't have to be a geodesic. So I'm calling this one here H. I, yeah, this one here is H. So here's a particular C that we get because it's uh, not tangent to H, it's not orthogonal to H. You make some angle with H and uh, you go, you go kind of out along this and then you project and then you come back along here. So this is actually a CST biangle. It's automatic on a sphere. So this is a CST biangle where C is sort of determined by the angle between this, this geodesic and that geodesic. I could just as easily have made the UV a latitude circle. And we would get another example. This, this, uh, this thing does not have to be a just geodesic down here, but I didn't find a picture with a latitude circle in it. So you see what I mean by biangle. You have this thing here and that thing here. They're just two sides to the, uh, to the uh, figure. And it may be actually better to think about this as being some kind of generalized closed geodesic where you kind of go out this way and then you project and you come back this way and it closes up. So here's the first theorem. So we can look at any Riemannian manifold, any submanifold of any dimension. The first result is when C is between zero and one. And uh, I make an assumption I'm not even going to explain about the set of biangles when T is zero. Yeah. Clean means that it forms a nice manifold. So uh, here I'm going to make, however, a big assumption on the test function psi, <laughs> namely that psi hat is uh, supported in a small interval around zero. In fact, for C equals one, biangles with S equals T equals zero form an isolated point. Well, the, uh, so anyway, we get, we get an asymptotic formula for the Kuznetsov vial sums, the sums of the squares of the Fourier coefficients uh, in the C interval. And uh, so we get a main term and a remainder. And the principal interest, I think, of the main term is that, well, the power does not depend on the co-dimension of H, as it turns out. <laughs> However, the leading, leading coefficient really, uh, it's got a very simple formula in terms of psi hat. Uh, this is really basically the volume of uh, S, C sub H of M, because it's fixed points for this uh, flow. And at T equals S equals zero, they're all fixed. We get the Hausdorff measure, we get the Riemannian d-dimensional measure of H. So the, the two sort of interesting things about this formula are number one, that the, that the power does not depend on the dimension. It's completely universal. In fact, it doesn't really make any assumptions about the flow of M about the behavior of H, the dimension of H, the type of submanifold, nothing. It's completely universal. Even this coefficient here does not refer in any serious way to H. And we see also that something bad is gonna happen when C is zero or C is one. Those are the endpoints of the interval. And indeed, these asymptotics are completely different from the original asymptotics I derived uh, when C is equal to zero and uh, where this coefficient would vanish 
Uh, also, if, if H is a hypersurface, this coefficient blows up. And uh, it could do lots of different things in between. So the edge, the edges are very, very, this is where a lot of the action is at the edges. Very common theme that in the bulk, you get kind of universal behavior and at the edges, you don't. So, okay. So now, here's a, a, a kind of interesting remark for people in spectral asymptotics. We're very interested in the uh, jumps. So here I wrote down the jumps more rigorously because if we have multiple eigenvalue, lambda j, then we have to sum over all the an orthonormal basis of eigenfunctions with that eigenvalue. And we get a kind of double sum here. Now, when you want to understand jump behavior, you notice that the first term here is continuous and does not contribute to jumps. So the jumps are all provided by the remainder term. And sort of a standard Tauberian method gives you a remainder estimate, which is uh, one lower order than the principal term. Now, the thing is that, you know, we can write down the jump is the jump of the remainder since the principal term is continuous. But as yet, we don't know anything about the remainder. How continuous actually is that remainder? So as a corollary, we can derive jump, jump estimates, but this corollary is not a smart corollary because we're just using the size of the remainder term to estimate the jump. Whereas we really should estimate the jump of the remainder term. And that is kind of like a ubiquitous problem in spectral asymptotics that estimating a jump by a remainder does not take into account the continuity properties of the remainder. All right, so these are kind of universal results. Well, let's look at the edge for a moment. What happens when we look at the edge? So when we look at the edge, it really is gonna depend now on whether the submanifold is totally geodesic or whether it has positive geodesic curvature, such as a non-degenerate second fundamental form. It is going to be not universal. It has it depends on many things. So um, that's what I, that's all I was saying here. Now um, the the extremals for Fourier coefficients will always be occurring at the edge. So we sort of want to understand that. We want to understand the asymptotics. Now what happens at the uh, at the edge? if H is totally geodesic, is that um, the equation for bi-angles becomes trivial. It turns out it's not actually trivial for one reason, but the equation's trivial because, <laughs> because uh, if C equals one, the projection of, of C has the same length as C. As we saw before, that means C is tangent to H. And since H is totally geodesic, that means that when we study biangles, they're just going out along a geodesic tangent to H and then coming back, backwards along an angle tangent to H. I mean, along back, along exactly that same geodesic, you're just going out along a geodesic and back. And obviously you have no solutions unless uh, T is like zero, so that when you go out and back, you come back to the origin again. But that's not quite true because if T is period, a period of H, then you can still go around, around the closed geodesic of H and then come back. So that, in, that sort of indicates that the periodicity properties of H are gonna play an important role in how the, in the behavior here. So I, I drew this picture again, but um, all right. Now here's the, here's the asymptotics now when, when you have a totally geodesic submanifold and uh, of dimension D in a, a Riemannian manifold. And uh, the leading coefficient now becomes very complicated. And so I'm going to only state it when the test function psi hat <coughs> is supported sufficiently close to zero so that uh, it doesn't extend across the injectivity radius. 
So you get, uh, for one thing, the first thing you see is you get a completely different power. You now get lambda to the n plus d over two, which depends on d. And um, secondly, the leading order coefficient is very different. When c equals one, I mean, c less than one, we, the dependence on psi hat was just psi hat at zero. But here we integrate in, in S. And geometrically speaking, this is obvious because we have G at SX of any length long H, we go out and then we come back when T equals zero. They could be of any length at all. There's no constraint on them. Before when C was less than one, the only solutions nearby S and T are both zero is when S is zero. So that's why you get a different answer. And you get a, uh, you get a complicated, well, it's sort of a complicated volume density here, which is given by this formula. So I'll explain it on the next slide. But uh, using the same thing, if the, G, if the geodesic flow on H has, has almost no periodic orbits, the set of periodic orbits is measure zero, then you get a small O remainder term. But most of the work actually goes into like really figuring out this, um, how this depends on psi hat. It's rather complicated computation. So many of you will recognize this notation here, but I'll explain it on the next slide. These are going to be uh, volume densities and normal coordinates. And before I go on, I just want to mention that because you have them to the power minus one half, <laughs> when you get conjugate points, these things blow up. That's why this, this, uh, this is again constrained by the psi hat, the support of psi hat is constrained because you're gonna get complicated contributions from conjugate points. So here, this is, uh, this is a standard notation for the volume density in geodesic normal coordinates. You write down the volume density this way. I should note, by the way, that you have the volume density on M and you also have the volume density on H. So you have to sort of understand conjugate points on H and conjugate points on M to get a, to get a longer time formula. Mm -hmm. um, so the reason why you get this uh, integral rather than just getting psi hat of zero, why you get a singularity like this, why you get this singularity at S equals zero is uh, it's due to the fact that you have a kind of blowdown singularity in the, in the relevant Lagrangian manifolds when S is equal to zero. Those blowdown singularities do not occur uh, when C is less than one. So in order to avoid using like for integral operators ad adapted to blowdown submanifolds or something, I just work them out using paramatrices. Now, so let's just compare C less than one and C equal to one. I'm sort of running out of time and there's something I want to get to, so. Um, by the way, is this talk over in one minute or 10 minutes? Please take your time. Please take some more minutes. All five right, minutes. thank you. Please. Ooh, five minutes is not taking my time. All right, so mm -hmm. when C is less than one, we got this answer and this coefficient. We notice that this coefficient is, is singular when C equals one. And now we see that we get a totally different type of power when C equals one and a totally different type of coefficient. As a distribution in psi, it's a completely different type of distribution. In principle, this could be a global in time, in S time distribution, as long as you can uh, regularize this, uh, this uh, volume density at conjugate points. So, okay, so we see how these things are very different. And... Um, mm -hmm. I now want to sort of like, like what is gonna be responsible for extremal behavior in these coefficients? So a kind of first guess is that the periodicity properties of the geodesic flow both on M and H have to conspire in order to produce a very large jump term, very large sum of squares of Fourier coefficients in the C equals one integral or the C less than one interval. <laughs> now, why are periodicities of the geodesic flow important? We've sort of seen a little bit of that, but people familiar with spectral asymptotics know that the periodicity of the geodesic flow of a manifold effect uh, has a very strong effect 
on the distribution of the eigenvalues. Periodicity gives you clustering. So if you look at this jump formula, and if you had a periodic geodesic flow on H, just like one closed geodesic would be periodic geodesic flow, then you're going to get clustering of a, of a kind along an arithmetic progression in these mm -hmm. mu's. And if you get clustering, if you get clustering, there are a lot of terms here. If you get mu clustering, that mm -hmm. means like a lot of eigenvalues piled up around specific lambda j's. Then for certain values of C, if you pile up around those particular C lambda j's and you have a lot of clustering there, you get big contribution. But then you don't get a big contribution where you don't have clustering. So these periodicity effects can have very subtle behavior in terms of both the remainder and the main term. The periodicity property on M is important because uh, high periodicity gives you potentially high multiplicity of the lambda J eigenvalues. So you might have many, many terms you're summing over here. However, it's not so simple as what I'm saying. It's definitely not just that. And so to understand this, I'm going to go to everybody's favorite eigenfunctions, which are called Gaussian beams. Probably everybody here is very familiar with Gaussian beams. Gaussian beams are eigenfunctions, or often quasi-modes, along a closed geodesic, mm -hmm. but it's got to be a stable closed geodesic. And they are like extremely large on the geodesic of size, like uh, lambda to the half, or if you, if you write it in lambda to the one fourth, if you write it in terms of degrees of spherical harmonics, they have a, 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 a sort of telltale oscillation along the geodesic. And then they have Gaussian decay orthogonal to it. So they look a bit like this uh, equator here. You know, this, this does not show the oscillations of a Gaussian beam along the equator. It just shows you Gaussian decay in the transverse direction. This picture over here shows you oscillations along the geodesic. So for example, although these Gaussian beams are enormous along the geodesic in absolute value, if you integrate them, you get zero. Because, uh, because of the e to the i n theta. If you don't study Frey coefficients, you will never see like why they're large. All right. Now, I just was writing out, I think I'm gonna sort of skip this a little bit, but you know, this is a Gaussian beam for this. This is the highest weight spherical harmonic on a standard sphere and it has size n to the one fourth. So this, these Frey coefficients will saturate the estimates when n equals two and d equals one. So I think I'm gonna move on from that. So a heuristic idea should be that periodicity of the geodesic flows is not enough. In fact, there's counterexamples. Because you can have a surface, a convex surface of revolution in R3. Its geodesic flow is not periodic yet. It has a Gaussian beam along the equator. It saturates the remainder estimates. And you did not use geodes the periodicity of the geodesic flow M in, in that example. So we sort of see that. And on the other hand, as I say here, if the surface of revolution is like a peanut and the H is the equator, which is a hyperbolic geodesic, you do not have a Gaussian beam on a hyperbolic geodesic. And you do not saturate. The, the remainder term, you get a log lambda. It does not saturate it, which shows you that there's something subtler than just periodicities of geodesic flows going on. You sort of need to understand the hyperbolicity of, of a submanifold H. What kind of Jacobi fields you have uh, sort of uh, along geodesics of, of, of H. So, uh, that's sort of reflected by those terms, theta inverse, theta inverse, because those are wedge products of vertical Jacobi fields. And you had one of them on M and one of them on H. So you can see that the, that the hyperbolicity or ellipticity is reflected by Jacobi fields will play a role. Um, I think I'm going to skip that in view of the time. And, uh, just notice that, by the way, spheres have a lot more complicated geometry in them, I think, 
I think actually I have to skip that and get to the to the re concluding remarks. So to me, as I said, there are quite a lot of phenomenon just in understanding the, let's see, one moment. I should probably do this. If you really want to understand this, this uh, middle term and, and the extremals, what you want to do, uh, the, so somebody in spectral asymptotics, you want to prove a Safarov type vial formula. That is, in a sense, you want to get a second term. You want a, mil, you want a second term plus a little o. You want your remainder to be something like this plus small o. And the remainder term involves an oscillating function called q. And so far of, for point-wise vial asymptotics calculated q, you can read it in his book with Vasiliev. However, you can't actually expect this to be really a second term. And that's because it's complicated, but this q function is really dynamical. And it really reflects, it really reflects periodic behavior uh, of the flows. But these are not, these, these periods and things, you get clustering around the periods, but the actual eigenvalues are not in general equal to the periods. And as a result of that, you can't really get a middle term like this. And so you have to sort of sandwich the Kuznetsov vial in between these things, sort of in between two, two of these sort of shifted middle term asymptotics. Now the point is that as Safar pointed out, if these Q functions are continuous, which happens in the hyperbolic case, they don't contribute to jumps. If the Q, if you have an elliptic case, then these Q functions are discontinuous and they do. So the, the sort of like structural angle of attack uh, to understand what produces you know, really extremal jumps is first to prove to, to, to improve the theorems to two-term asymptotics, which is what's in progress to actually calculate these Q functions. Uh, now, um, let me conclude with, uh, with sort of like where it's all going. I've sort of talked about this. I, I've talked about this series. So, it's, it's sort of really trying to understand the equipartition of the Fourier coefficients. When do they Fourier coefficients concentrate? When are they kind of uniform? And so I wanted to write this out for, for anybody in the audience who may have studied restriction problems, spatial restriction problems in quantum ergodicity, because it, there's a very nice comparison in what we're doing to what, what we do in that field. Namely, you have this spectral projector that I wrote down before. You have a spectral projection on H for the restricted eigenfunction. And these are the jumps. And they can be written out as matrix elements of the projector. Now, this is very analogous to what you do in quantum ergodic restriction theory, but you put a pseudo differential operator in there along H, not, not, this, not this projector. Now, the projector is essentially a semi-classical Fourier integral operator. So in a way, what we're asking about is very similar to quantum ergodic restriction theory, but we're putting in an FIO into this, uh, into this operator here instead of a pseudo differential operator. So that gives you some indication that there are techniques for being able to understand what we're doing. <laughs> um, the goal eventually is to understand this, this Fourier profile, like for restriction to a closed curve. How do these Fourier coefficients behave? Or if you want to write it out, this is a subject that uh, Mike Geis has been writing about in his thesis as well. Um, if you sort of make an empirical measure out of the Fourier coefficients, what kind of weak limits does it have? And what we've done in this talk is study the expected value of this measure integrated over very short intervals. If we want to really go on and try to understand equipartition, we need to understand the variance. Okay, so let me stop here. <sighs> okay, thank you very much, Steve, for the very, very nice talk. Are there any questions or comments, please? Please feel free to unmute yourself. Are there any questions or comments, please?
Any questions or comments, please? Okay, yeah. if not, I like it. Any... Oh, oh great. great. From Dr. Matt Gilliman. Excuse me? I liked it. I think uh, this is all developed quite a ways from uh, Dr. Matt Gilliman. Yes, yes, you're right. Um, but Gilliman and Uribe sort of uh, uh, developed this ladder theory, which we use, but then it involves. But the Safari thing is yet another extension and there. Yeah, it involves quite a lot of things. So. <laughs> Great. Are there any other comments or questions, please? Okay, if not, thank you very much, Steve, for the very nice talk. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, thank you.